difference in the world between the career criminal who sets out deliberately to burgle a house and the terrified homeowner who acts to protect himself and his home. Once at the home of the farmer Tony Martin, the pair broke into the property and very quickly the gunshots began. He did shoot the teenage boy, but to many people he did nothing more than exercise the right to protect his property. I reckon they should just forget the law and just let people take it into their own hands nowadays because it's the only way it's going to work. The law says, as in any other case where you claim self-defence, you must act reasonably. Mr. Martin, come in. Have a seat. I'm Detective Constable Peters, and my colleague interviewing with me is... Detective Sergeant Newton. Right, Mr. Martin, can you introduce yourself by giving your full name and date of birth, please? My name is Anthony Edward Martin, and I was born on the 16th of December, 1944. At the moment, you have declined to have a legal representative. Yes. Is there any reason why you don't want to have a solicitor at this time? I've had a horrendous experience. Are you OK now? Right, well, I've got to caution you, Mr Martin. The caution is as follows. You do not have to say anything but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you say may be given in evidence. Do you understand the caution? Yes. Could you just sign this form to say that you consent to being interviewed without the presence of a solicitor? Just uh, here. Look. Thanks very much, Mr. Martin. Now, the offence for which you've been arrested is attempted murder. What, in your words, happened yesterday? I really can't tell you. What are you saying? Your memory's gone. Why is it you can't tell us? What do you remember about the incident? I really can't tell you. It's an absolute nightmare. It's I just... Is it because you don't want to tell us, Mr. Martin? I was asleep and I heard a noise. And I've heard so many noises over the years that really I just don't want to ponder on it at the moment. It's so horrendous. You're so vulnerable. 
There is nobody to help you. Whereabouts were you asleep? You're on your own. I was up in the bedroom. Where did you hear the noises? I don't know. I just live in one room. I've never been so afraid in all my life, I hate to admit it. I don't know whether it's a failing to say that, but I really... absolutely terrified. I just don't wish to discuss it any more today. Thank you very much. I just want... I just want solace. I wanted it for so long. I can't get any peace. Well, can you describe where you live, please? I live at a place called Bleak House. I live down a pea gravel drive with lime trees. OK, so we've established that you were upstairs having a sleep. I'd gone to bed for the night. The noise you heard downstairs inside the house. What do you do next? I really don't want to talk about it. Have you got a shotgun? I don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, I mean, that's not talking about it. I mean, that, that's a simple question. You either have or have not got a shotgun. I just, I just don't want to talk about it anymore today. See, we need some answers to our questions. Because from our inquiry so far, we believe you were responsible for shooting a man by the name of... Brendan Fearon. Well? Did you shoot anybody last night? What if I were to put it to you that you said to, uh, Paul Leet? They were in my house. I don't know who they were, but they had pulled a window out. Was that right? Well, I don't really know. When you say they, what do you mean? We've only got one man injured. Well, there were people talking. How many? I don't know. There was more than one. Inside the house or outside the house? Inside the house. You told Paul Leet you shot somebody last night. You shot at them. All we want to know is what did you use to shoot at them? Where were them and why did you shoot at them? That's what we want to know because you're the person with the gun pulling the trigger. We just need to know your account of what occurred yesterday that resulted in a man staggering to the Leets with serious shotgun wounds. You also, I believe, said if the judges lock them up, they wouldn't have to lock me up for what I did. Well, I don't know what I did say. I, I think you're being slightly evasive here, Mr. Martin. I am not being evasive about anything. I well, don't... you're being selective, aren't well, you? Well, no, I don't even know what you're talking about, about being selective. You are. Because you're being selective about what you care to remember and who you care to remember it to. You're prepared to talk to Paul Leet about this matter, but you are not prepared to talk to us. My life's a nightmare. I've had a lot of nightmares in my life. I've had a lot of things pull me right down, but I tell you, this is something... Well, tell us about this. I just can't handle it. 
I'd just rather go back to my cell and read Churchill. Mr. Martin, would you like to speak to a solicitor? I just want some peace. I'm very tired. Mr. Martin, you have... That's the end of this conversation. I don't want to relive it. Well, at some stage, you're going to have to relive it. No, no, I don't have to do anything. Well, I told you before, I was terrified. You're terrified about what? Well, I can't tell you that now, because you'll turn it and twist it. We won't twist anything. We're, we, we're not here to judge. We're here to gather evidence and let somebody else decide. Now, take me to Norwich prison. Get rid of me out of the way. Mr. Martin... I wish I was in China. They put a bullet in my bloody head and I'll be finished out of the way. I'm finished. This conversation is finished. May I please go back to the cell? You will shortly. <sighs> Come on, you're a man of the world. You're a man of principles. And you've let yourself down, haven't you? You've become something that you despise. Haven't you really, Mr. Martin? I have a son, Anthony Martin. He lives at Bleak House, Smeath Road. He has lived there for about the last 20 years. on his own. The house and contents were left to him by his aunt on her death. Earlier this year, someone stole items from Anthony's house. He was very upset. Since that event, he has talked more and more about his worries and fears. My son has always been very highly strung and has a tendency to worry about things. At 2300 hours, on Friday the 20th of August, police were called to a house in Hungate where a man was found suffering from gunshot wounds. You, Mr. Martin, were arrested on suspicion of attempted murder. You were interviewed by myself and Detective Sergeant Newton about that offence. Now, unbeknown to us, at the time of your interview, the body of a young man was discovered by the police in the grounds of your home. Fred Barras. Night to the 20th of August 1999, Brendan Fearon and Freddie Barris were driven by a third man to the vicinity of Bleak House. Brendan Fearon was 30 and has a criminal record for burglary, criminal damage, assault, and wounding. Fred Barris was only 16. He also had a number of findings of guilt for dishonesty and bad or violent behavior. There was evidence that he had told an acquaintance that he was planning a burglary on a remote farm in Norfolk.
Just round to the left here, please, Mr. Michael. So that everybody in this room knows what's happened. You were arrested by me in your cell on suspicion of this man's murder. In order to assist my client today in recounting the offences which he's under arrest for, he has prepared some notes. I would be grateful if officers, you could show a degree of forbearance when he's going through those notes, as you will appreciate. It's a difficult time for him. I must remind you, you are still under the caution I gave you when we started the tape. Do you remember? Yes. Will you now give us an account of what occurred at your home on Friday evening? Well, on this piece of paper that I've been writing things on while asleep last night, things are clearer. Um, Nothing is in order in this statement that I'm making. I, I'm just going from notes from paper, but, um, um... I've had many threats over the years on my own property, minding my own business. I stopped reporting them to the police because I felt that I was not being taken seriously. Since I've had two previous break-ins this year in my house, I don't go out very often. And may I say, all the time, over the months and months and months of this, that it is a fearful place where I live. I can only do it, explain this, the whole history of my life living at Bleak House. Nobody comes into my house. I'm not strange. I want you to understand why. I've never ever discussed this, not even with my mother, not until about four or five years ago. I do not want this to go public. We had a small cottage over at March. There was a man. He used to stay with us. As I got older, I don't know what age, I can't remember now. He used to try and molest me. And that's had a great effect upon my life. It made me very self-conscious when I was a youngster and I really thought people thought I was queer. Now, some people say that people play on that, but I've had the experience and it doesn't leave you. It is a scar. And this is why, one of the reasons, I live on my own. Nobody ever comes into my house. What I would ask you now is will you give us your account of what occurred at your home on Friday evening?
The gun I've had for some time. I only decided to use it as I was sure people were coming up the stairs. The only protection I had is the top of the stairs is missing and the bottom of the stairs is missing. I did it like that. I'm a little bit lost. You're saying that there are stairs missing at the bottom and there were stairs missing at the top. Yeah, but you can still get up the stairs. I made it so you can still get up the staircase. I suppose I am wrong in law. Anybody should come in the house. He shouldn't be a thief and he fell down the stairs. He'd sue me. Better than where I am today. There's no lights in my house. My bedroom that night was the only place there was a light. I was sure people were coming up the stairs. In fact, I really thought somebody was on the landing. I went back to the bedroom to try and hide, and then there's this knock. So I took the gun out, loaded it, waited, and it seemed like forever. And at that stage, we're talking in maybe trillions of seconds, I have to make decisions. And, and I had no choice. I walked out of the bedroom, along the landing, down the stairs, halfway down the stairs. And down there, I see some reflection of some feet. Now I see this light shining in my face. And what do I do? Who is it? And all of these things are all in a flash. And I just couldn't stand it any longer. And then I just let the gun off. Do you know how many times you fired the gun? Can't remember. Until it was empty? Until it was empty. I ran up the stairs. Nobody followed me up. I went into the bedroom. I came back out, went down the stairs. Looked around in that room. There's nobody there. Then I noticed the cupboard, an oak cupboard. There was a drawer open. Then suddenly at my feet I noticed there was this hole door, Adidas or something. With it. And there was some kind of silver in it. And then I thought, well, how have they got in the house? I noticed on the garden side the windows missing. Then I got in my car and I drove. Were you aware that you had actually shot some people at this time? No. Because all I knew was there was at least one person with a torch. So you're saying you fired at the torch? No, I fired below the torch. In the direction of the torch, but below that? Below. Did you have the gun with you when you went for your drive around? Sorry? Did you have your gun with you when you went for your drive around? Well, I didn't leave it in the house. There might have been somebody still in the house. I was looking for where these people had gone. Did you find anybody? No. I, uh, I never saw anybody at all. I had a route around the garden. I mean, you're relatively safe in a car. Then I went round Paul Leitz, cos I knew he'd had at least one break-in during daylight. I thought I'd better go and tell, so I told him what I thought might have happened. 
Apparently, Mr. Leet tells you to phone the police. According to our records, you didn't do so. Well, I didn't know what to do. And what do I do with this gun? Went to see my mother. I'm going to have to give myself up, and I wanted a little bit of time left for a little bit of freedom to get me into a state of rationality. And I hid it in her toilet. You hid the gun in the toilet? I didn't hide it. I just put it in there and I left. And then I thought, shall I go home? No. No, I didn't want to go home. What was there to go home to? You said you had to give yourself up. For what? What did you think you'd done other than discharge your gun? One of my near neighbors is a man I know as Tony Martin. About a week before the shooting, we struck up a conversation and somehow the subject of burglaries came up. I remember Tony saying words to the effect that if he caught anyone trying to burgle him again, he would shoot them. You sure? I would describe Tony as an eccentric whose behavior does not conform to what I consider normal. He wasn't a man who showed fear and I believe Tony could lose his temper quickly. He could be intimidating to people he didn't like. do not think he himself could be easily intimidated. Is that the gun that you used? Uh, it looks like it, yes. That's the gun that was recovered? Well, I don't really remember much about it. <laughs> but that is the gun that your mother handed to us, the police. OK, then. Feel, reading back earlier, I haven't made it clear to you that my horrendous experience, uh, this breaking with my gun and on the staircase, I want to make it clear that when I fired my gun, I genuinely thought my life was in danger. I don't know whether I explained it to you that this moment of seconds, or however long it takes, uh, the torch pointed at me. I really didn't know what was coming behind that. We haven't asked any questions yet. But we intend to. The first question I want to ask you... Where were you when you first heard the intruders in your house? I was in my bed. You were in your bed? Yes. Were you asleep? Yes. So, obviously, the noise woke you up? Yes, I just sort of turned over. I mean, I actually sleep with my working clothes on, and I've got my working boots on. This is one of the oddities with me. Uh, it does have advantages that if something is to call unexpected, it's better to be running around with shoes on rather than trying to find and tie up shoes. Right. And your first thoughts were of... Surprise, how would you describe it? Alarm. Right. 
Where was the shotgun? Under my bed. So, you lay there, listening to noises. You are fully dressed. Can you describe to me what you do next? Well, my brain had already told me things weren't right. Then I heard, like, a slithering. Then there was a banging, then there was a smashing, and then there was... Uh, Murmurings and was Well, I lay there with rigor mortis. And then I had to get down to reality. I'd been broken into, I assumed. Did you feel under the bed for the gun? No, that was after I went out to the stairs where I saw what looked like car lights or beams coming up the stairs, really bright. I went back to the bedroom and I had to make a decision. And I mean, the, the noise and the fear and the nightmare that was upon me it was just like being in a horror movie. I couldn't ring anybody, the phone is downstairs, and I just frantically went and got the gun. Where did you get the cartridges from? Out of a bag. Where was the bag? In the bedroom. So you loaded the gun where? In the bedroom. Right. How did you go down the stairs? Well, it is a bit dodgy. You are talking about the top of the stairs. There is a bit missing. Mm, yeah, very dodgy with a gun. Did you get to the bottom of the stairs? No, you have to come down the stairs enough to see into the hallway, and that's about as far as I dare go. So you correct me if I'm wrong. You were on the stairway when you saw the men, when you were holding your gun. Yes. Somewhere, you think, midway between up and down? Wherever it was to give me vision to see. Into the room, right? You're halfway down the stairs, you have the gun, what do you see? Pardon? If you're halfway down the stairs, you have the weapon in your hand, what do you see? I see a torch. One torch that you're aware of. As far as I know, one torch. Right. What happened next? Well, there were mumblings. You didn't catch the words that were being said? No. At any time? No. Did anybody ever speak to you? No. Did you ever speak to the man? No. Did you, at any time, warn or shout to anybody that you were there? No, I, I didn't do anything. No. You didn't think to do that? No. Were all the shots fired from the same position, from halfway up the stairs? Yes. You didn't move at all? No. N not that I know of. What was your actual intention when you went down with the gun? My intention was I was in fear of my life or of being very badly maimed or beaten up or anything. All those things crossed my mind. It seemed to me that the gun was the safest way for me and I didn't know why that torch just kept on peering at me for so long. At that stage, I didn't know what was going to happen. Why didn't you fire a warning shot? I really... <laughs> I just... As I said before, I have had some experiences in my time and, you know, people can pop out from anywhere and... I didn't even... Why didn't you show the warning? Um...
Mr. Martin is a victim of crime. He knew that an unknown number of people had broken into his dark, isolated house that night. He did not know if they were armed. He was in a situation where he had to make some desperate decisions. What would you do? The wrong decision on his part could lead him to suffer serious injury or even death. This case is about self-defense, the right all citizens have. This interview is being tape recorded and the time is now 14.52 hours. At what stage did you realize that someone had been hit, someone had been shot? I never realized anybody had been shot. But did nobody scream or shout for help? Nothing, not a thing. You didn't hear anything at all, no shouts, no moans, no screams? The only noise I heard was the blast of a gun. You heard not even a shout? Nope. Did you realize you'd hit anybody at all? I heard no noise at all. Why didn't you phone the police? I suppose it's because whatever happened at the time, I hadn't got a gun license and I didn't know how I stood. Mr. Martin, that's the least of your problems, isn't it? Whether you've got a gun license or not. I know I keep going back to this, and this is my last question on this particular point. Did you actually give them a chance to surrender? I stood there. I assume they saw me. And I don't know how long this moment was. And that torch was put on me. And that seemed like forever. And nobody said a word. Nobody moved or did anything. So, they didn't come towards you? I don't know what they did. You said nobody moved. Well, I said... They didn't come towards you, but you still fired the gun. I fired the gun after I got to the point... Um, I was in a very, I don't know how to put it, in a very regrettable position. I don't know if that's the right way to put it, but that was the position. I don't know what else to say. Edward Martin, the charges of murder, that on the 20th of August 1999 at Bleak House, Smeath Road, Emnath, you murdered Fred Barris. You do not have to say anything. Guilty of 
murder, yeah? Well, the jury had been deliberating for nine hours. They came back into court within the past couple of minutes on the first charge of murder, murdering 16-year-old Fred Barris. Uh, the jury foreman stood up and said that they'd found him guilty on a majority of 10 to 2. The court was told that Brendan Fearon had told the police that as the gunfire began, he heard uh, Fred Barris shout out, he's got me, I'm sorry, please don't, and then finally the word mum. Now, as this was read out to the court, many of the Barris family who were sitting in the public gallery broke down in tears. Uh, they heard the court told that Fred Barris died within two minutes of being shot and he suffered a gunshot wound to the back. When the foreman of the jury said one word, guilty, Tony Martin looked astonished. I genuinely don't think it has crossed Tony Martin's mind, quite frankly, that he may possibly end up in jail for what he did. Oh, Christ. Now then. I wonder what's in there. I wonder what's in there. When's the last time you were in there? When I left on uh, August 20th, 1999. You've never been in the house since? No. No. Your, your house is boarded up now? Yes. But you can't live here now? I could do if I wanted to. Why don't you? I don't want to get locked up. What, what do you mean by that? Well, it's simple. If I'm in the house and somebody comes in the house, I'm going to look after myself. If you think I'm going to stand there and ask them what they do, I'm not that stupid. Well, <laughs> given everything that's happened to you? Yes. When you start to run, you'll be forever running. So you have to stand your ground. I'd been very fearful for a long time in that house. And all of a sudden, the fear went. And I took my life back for a while, for a few hours. The fact that this boy died, does that weigh heavy? He wasn't a boy, he was a young man. Does it weigh heavy, though? No, no, don't even think about it. I'm, I, I obviously, basically, I sympathise for the mother saying, well, I only had one boy and now he's dead. But it's no good blaming me. When I was his age, I lived at Redmore with my grandparents. I didn't go around breaking in bloody houses 60 miles down the road. With me, it was diminished responsibility, and there's nothing diminished about me. And with a burglar, well, what goes round comes round. I'll tell you what I did have, it was very interesting once to me. There was a young chap in prison, and they're all over 21, but he seemed to be more like about 18. And I, you don't ask questions, unless it's the right time. And I found out he was a burglar breaking people's houses. And I said, um, why do you break in people's houses? He said, well, he says, that's the way things are. And when he walked away, <laughs> I don't know what's given the game away, whether you think I'm mental or not. When he walked away, I went bang, like that. And he's <laughs> he walking away now. No, that's only my fingers, isn't it? Bang! 
something like that. He said, well, what's all this? I said, that's how things are, boy. 